that it isn't over the synoptic problems or, or over whether Paul contradicts himself between Romans and Galatians on promise. It is over evil, nor I have a very important bibliography uh, on evil, but I want just to discreditly pass that out. But that may not be the thing you choose. But most people that think at all, it would be evil still. That's not a new problem, but that's an intense problem. Uh, that's the reason that I reject Christianity. I reject the gospel. So I have four or five copies, but I, I'm not passing them out because of uh, hundreds of man hours. There's ten thousand dollars worth of work in, in that. And if, if you're not going to deal with evil, well, then you don't get. To. Or any any uh, prayer matters this morning. We got. Uh, there's a guy on the dormitory that he just got the call last night that said he's going to be sent out for. He's going to be sent out to Germany for now. You know, well, that means that the tank group will be sent out. Cool. Who is that? That's Mike Johnson. He's an undergrad. All, all right. Now, now, this is Mike. You're going to pray for Mike Johnson. Uh, I heard that he might get called, but I hadn't heard that he was yeah, called. He just got called uh, last night. Well, that's that's what that means. See, he's going to Germany. Uh, they have the most advanced tanks there, and they'll send the tank crew preparation over for the front. <clears throat> Those tanks there are prepared for gas, for chemical warfare. And meets up on the line. So in a minute, for a second, a few seconds, you pray. Any anyone else? Just singular in several different three different places in China. That the students in university that uh, have Bibles and would have some Christian contact, they're told every day, even in the elementary schools, that uh, China needs scientists and science is opposed to religion. They're still hearing that. In fact, their textbooks are from the 30s and 40s. They don't even seem to be aware of... Uh, uh, so I, I can't imagine at uh, at least the school, the school level, awareness level, that's not the single most important uh, apologetic effort to show them that intelligent people do work in science. And uh, they couldn't believe it. Uh, see, had I known that was their problem, I would have carried books, but I can't spend $35 there mailing a, uh, a book, so I certainly want to send things with you, and I can't imagine around university students, that's not a prime thing. Most of them uh, that we met are in English literature, but that's not because they're interested in English literature, it's that they're, in, they're interested in English. And they know it's science that will make a difference. See, they know that, but they're studying studying something else for too long. So uh, I, I know Scott's going to open up uh, very important doors, but I don't want to forget that project when we get what is the relationship of trying to support the Christian faith. Anyway, when this book comes in, even though we have three copies in the library, there's a battery of questions in here. One of the assignments is that you answer these questions. I held that off last week. I thought they would be here today. They're questions, and you could use them See, formulating questions, if you, you're in a congregation, if you're in a, in a, a collegiate situation, uh, the questions at the end of the chapter, and even though these are quite elementary, the issues are well taken. And uh, he's talking uh, in a larger scope than classical apologetic efforts. See, the condition, the situation in the world, they don't set the gospel, but they determine what it is we must address. And there's no point thinking that what Augustine addressed or Pascal addressed is going to be a powerful matter in the 1990s. That's all I'm saying. I don't mean that truth collapses or anything, but we have to contextualize, and that's the first thing that I'm going to attempt to do to show you changing context, changing worldviews. It's like Jesus never discussed miracle with the Jews because the Jews believed in miracles. You didn't have to discuss it. So all the things that aren't discussed, but now it's the animus in the world and the New Agers. Uh, see, the most advanced discussion of miracles the, is the uh, two-volume, $75 New Age book on miracles. The only reason we don't have that here for you to read is we can't spend $75 on a New Age book when we need $3 million worth of different books. But see, that, that set of books in the New Age where everybody's doing miracles. See, not just charismatics in Indianapolis, you know, 
uh, doing miracles around the world. I'm not saying that I believe they do, but everybody does miracles. So if they do, well then any discussion of Christian miracle dissipates in its power. I said, well, uh, you might convert to the Maharaji because he works miracles too. You have to discuss that. But the most extensively dis uh, distributed work on miracle is a New Age two-volume set. Can you imagine trying to deliver at this institution a uh, two-volume $75 book? See, even on such a... Anyway, first thing, but one or two of you have the books, and there are three copies. Now, please do not take them out and keep them all semester, and then say, well, now I don't need to buy the book. Because you can take this and translate this book into, into senior high camp, and that's, it's just a step above that. But it's what the book represents that I'm asking you to read. And then a very important thing when we get, also we'll have this book, How America Hears the Gospel. Uh, in a short, very simple thing, it's an analysis of the needs culture and the churches that are growing in the United States, not according to Winter Wagner, but they're growing when they have the immediate access to needs. They're meeting needs and, and uh, private interest groups. The churches that are growing will have 165, it's like the Willowing Creek Church, they have 250 paid employees. See, there's no problem that there's not money in the budget. You know, virgins over 15, virgins under 14. See, they, they've got ministries to every perimeter. Now, I'm not saying that that's good or bad. I'm not discussing that. But this is a very important, simple book. Now, not on the ice, but it's, it's simple and important. You could read it going home, but those are dangerous roads. So I don't want you driving going home. But it's not difficult. See, we've got some more difficult things. It's the issue. So how America hears the gospel, very important. So we have to examine the cultural mindset. So in about five minutes when I start, we look at the Bible, some points made in the Bible, the mindset changes. See, when, when we have Israel as a context, we have the Hellenistic world as a context, we have the patristics, to show you what changes and then what happens when we move into the modern period, the medieval period, and we can't, we're not in the medieval period, so there's no point having a seminar on medieval apologetics, but in the 20th century, the 1990s and the 21st century, churches are growing that does this. You know, I'm 29 and a divorcee with seven kids and I'm pregnant. I'll come to your church if you meet my needs. That's in America, but we take that model we need to examine every culture in the world. See? Every culture in the world and say, what is it that needs to be addressed in that culture? So in a simple, not hopefully non-insulting way, that is a project. So both of those things you'll need to read quickly because we're going to try to uh, deal with them uh, very hurriedly. Now the syllabus again, uh, uh, Scott, did you get, did I give you, uh, uh, a study of Hessel Graves communicating Christ cross culture. Okay. Not just what I think, it's these questions. I want you to memorize these questions about how people think, how people act, how groups make decisions. And in general, we want a world community apologetic, 24,000 ethnic groups, 7,000 languages and dialects. Here in China, with multiple dialects, uh, and two basic languages, you've got a billion and a quarter people. Well, how many people would it take to address a billion in the people? Just off the top of your head this morning. You see, a serious strategic planning, see, for the growth of the school, or the growth of the church, you see what that is? Now, don't forget, I want you to memorize those seven questions to see if they are entrance perimeters into thought patterns and only study can answer them see each uh, we have a precious brother see from from Asia the context is animism in, in Buddhism is, is this okay. well then he has a different matter than than America so it's not I'm not trying to deliver American apologetics or John Warlock Montgomery or Geisler's Thomism see there's some helpful things in those books but you'll find that they're radically limited unless they have a world perspective operating uh, on apologetic perimeters, okay? So you have that. I gave you the sheets, and immediately that's all I need. I gave you 
did I give you the sheets on Augustine? So uh, quickly about the syllabus one more time, but that'll be the project for you to do papers besides all these other things. Evil, how do we count for that? Apology, this is not standard thing, animism. Now the world of spirits, why is that? Because one half of the world population, one half of the world today, this hour, are animals. And only in a technical sense do we need to discuss in any advanced way, but all the different cultures have different names for the demons and the god. That's not false, but animism is a worldview. And what 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 the demons are called and how we do the incantations, whether in Haiti or in, uh, in Thailand, it is just a cultural matter. See, but the viewpoint is the same, to try to control the spirit world. So you might want to do a paper on evil. See, these are big chunks that you and I don't set. We don't set the agenda. We need to respond to the agenda. We'll do animism, and there's a book, and that book alone would be enough to precipitate what I'm asking for in this class. Dialogue and syncretism. Now dialogue, yes, syncretism, no. See, in other cultures, even American culture, and we're gonna hammer in on that even with our little book here, a whole lot of cultural syncretisms going on in the name of Christianity, and the church just looks like the culture. They said, well, it works. Yeah, because it's exactly what's in the culture. So the Christ and culture issue is uh, an issue. So syncretism, now what is that problem? That is, what is the relationship of Christ and gospel to cultural structures? I'm just talking about culture. Well, that's what these questions are in the reference to Hesse. You say, well, instead of apologetic, why don't you just do uh, the church growth approach? Well, church growth is just part of a worldview of analysis. See, whether it's at Fuller or Trinity or wherever, it's just part. But they're asking questions, but I want to ask the same kind of questions in Western high-tech megatrend culture, but they don't ask those. They think these questions just apply someplace else. I say they apply in all cultural structures. See? Now, gospel and culture, that means is there a gospel that is cross-cultural, that is translatable? You see, if uh, we're engaged uh, with uh, Islam, Islam is not cross-culturally communicable. You have to have a Muslim culture to have Islam. You cannot have Islamic faith. Even in America, the fastest growing group in the United States is Islam. Even here, they have to have a place that everything, all the dress, all the food, all the behavior looks Muslim. So it's over. Now, I don't know that that's a new term. I don't know that. But dialogue. Now, dialogue requires information. So there's a book on reserve. Now, please, if you're interested in this matter, and it's always, how do we take a message from culture A to culture B and get an audience with culture B? And how do we know that nothing from culture A filters the message. See, we might have a cultural message rather than the gospel of Christ. Does that make any kind of sense? So, syncretism and dialogue. This means information. What I say, dialogue, yes. Syncretism, no. Now, the West is clearly pagan again. Cultural. There isn't any question about that. Only the uninformed would have any questions about that. Now, a fourth thing is the matter of truth and resurgent world religions. Now, there just happened to be a valuable study coming from the, uh, from the Free University of Amsterdam on both these topics, and both those books are not in print anymore. They were in print and gone in six months. Now, how many of you in any church growth or mission class have read, in fact, the only thing at this level, if you're interested, is it true that Christianity is true? And is there no truth in any place else? Truth and truth. 
Now, missions implies what? That Christianity has something that no one has. Is, is that minimally the truth? Well, what if they say, well, we have truth. You've got no human system has all the truth. See, then we're into revelation, all, all kinds of implications. So this, Heinrich Kramer, now Kramer's bartend, but Kramer's books aren't even in print, and he was the last single person that had linguistic and cultural control over multiple Asian cultures. But he was, the books, any of them, for any missions class, right, read any of Heinrich Kramer's books, 50s and 60s. Even into the 70s, very bad. Uh, Christianity and World Cultures, I'll show you those books, but you don't need lots of books. It's the issue that I'm asking you to think about. We'll do research on them later, but the issue for your papers and larger things, does Christianity have truth and all the world, Buddhism, Hinduism, Tao, Shinto, uh, there's no truth in these, Islam? Well, those people think they're true. See, every person in every belief system believes they're true. There is no cultural possibility of the majority of people in a cultural context that, oh, we just happen to be born accidentally in this culture and nobody in this culture believes it's true. See, everyone believes whatever they believe is true. See, in this culture, in that culture, in that culture, or any of them, thousands and thousands of cultural structures. So we have to have some fundamental anthropological and sociological questions to ask, and only research can get it answers to those things. See, we can't sit back in an angel factory, you know, popping in answers from Augustine and Kierkegaard and Pascal and say, there you go there, there's a couple for the Buddhist priest over there in Thailand. True. Now does that ring any kind of bell? You see, in 1992, there will be not only a united economic system of Europe in 97, see over Hong Kong that Scott and I, uh, we spend our summers in, 1992 here be the second World Congress on religions in the United States. And that will be announcing that we are sending thousands of missionaries to America. We're sick and tired of getting all these troublemaking missionaries from America. That's just a signal. See? World religion. I'm not talking about the ecumenical spirits that believe everybody. <clears throat> you know, everybody's right. That's pluralism. Now, ready for that now. Pluralism as a... Now, in Newbegin's books, I didn't send get those because there's a limit to what you can buy. You know, I understand that. But there's not a limit to need. We have to address whatever the issues are. And if we don't have the funds for the library, well, then the student said, well, I'm really I'm going to be a pietist and not be interested in any of those things. Just meditate and pray a lot. Now, pluralism, does he? Newbie. Erdman has both of his books, The Gospel and a, uh, Cultural Pluralism and Foolishness to the Greeks. Both of those are extra valuable books. The, particularly the pluralism book, both of them paperback from Erdman, is on analysis of pluralism. Now, pluralism is not merely affirming that there are alternative viewpoints. There are always alternative viewpoints in Jerusalem. Huh? But pluralism, as a mindset, affirms that every one of these pluralistic structures of thought and cultural expression are true. See, that's a different thing. See, there can be witch doctors in Haiti, and one of our brothers, an elder uh, church in Haiti, has converted 150 witch doctors. Uh, there's been no example of this in the history of work in Haiti. Uh, but no miracles, no walking on the water, none of that. Just power of gospel. We either have a powerful gospel or we have to play some kind of games. Now, pluralism, you say, is that your problem? But see, that is our problem. See, I'm not asking what's your problem. Circle of wagons and say, how do you feel about all this? Any more than this precious lady that's terminally ill with cancer, and she doesn't go to the hospital, and they say, well, won't you sit down and tell us how you feel about this? That has nothing to do about her condition. It has to do about how she feels about her condition. And how she feels doesn't have any impact on her, on her condition at all. So let's don't get touchy-touchy and feely-feely and psychologize all of these things. 
But Newbegin's books, Gospel and Pluralism. Now we are in a pluralistic society, and that pluralism is fed from the Supreme Court, you know, progressively. And pluralism in America has moved the faith from public to private. And most people's faith is a private matter. Now, personal, maybe. See, we can't even, I'll try to get you a little outline on some biblical theology of faith. That's where we need to start. Maybe the Christian faith doesn't need any support. You know, it's possible. Hmm? Spock maybe doesn't need any. Well, we'll, we'll look, just for three or four weeks, that's not very long, but we'll look and see if the Bible thinks so. Hmm? And uh, so that's the tension between evangelism, church growth, uh, witnessing, preaching, and study, see education. What do you need to know? Well, what do you want to do? If you don't want to do anything, you certainly don't need to know much. It, and, and that makes sense, even this early in the morning, seeing it's but the third hour of the day, and these men are not drunken as you suppose. Public, now what is the nature? Uh, that's another, the nature of faith. But I'll just put this up. See, maybe Kierkegaard's right. Kierkegaard's a genius, and he redefined faith that removed it from any possibility of confrontation to the outside. Well, instead of helping the Christian faith, he opens us up to the ecumenical spirit that the Buddhists have faith, and Hindus have faith, and the Shintos have faith. Every belief system in the world is a faith system. But that hardly is helpful to see whether Christianity ought to bother people. See, you have a language and a culture. Why would anybody bother you with that? What right does anybody have to bother you? But when you became a Christian, you believed certain things. They didn't remove you from your language or your culture, but you believe different things, don't you? Believe different things as a Christian. Well, why do that? See, all that's at stake is the commission. Nothing else is at stake. The commission sends a bunch of busybodies to bother people who already have positions. Now, we want to be colonialists. You know, to make ever, everyone uh, Western white. God forbid that. Well, animism, evil, syncretism, truth and world religions, pluralism, the nature of faith in the midst of all that. Now, we certainly have to deal with science and technology. I mentioned to you early, Ern, that uh, uh, I, I want to present this as positive. Well, this is popular. Uh, Josh McDowell's books are what I call intelligent high school level books. You know, they're not, we're going to try to find the hot spots in the world where people are open. Now that's the old ridiculous discussion of open and closed. You know, should we spend a lifetime in 33 missionaries where nobody's beat like Japan? Should you spend? I, I don't want to enter that. See, I don't have any answer to that. But if, if we're in the principalities and powers conflict, we ought to put the troops where there's openness. I, I, can't, I can't encourage people to do otherwise. If you've got 10 troops, do you put five of the troops where the, the resistance is ever placed and put one where doors are I See, I don't have an answer. I don't want any classes to carry on a debate. You know, whether that's good or bad. Now, our missionaries can debate that because some of them don't have any more to do than write letters back to the United States. So these are the things. Now, I, we used to deal with Marxism. Now, there's a little thing, thing in, in this book on Marxism. But see, since 1989, except for a few little strong holdout groups of liberation theology among <coughs> the poor in the third and fourth world, see, Marxism is internationally been overthrown. So five years ago when we had apologetics before, we had to talk more about Marxism. I don't mean all the Marxists in the world are dead, but see Poland and Russia and Eastern Europe are proof that 70 years of, and 40 years in Eastern Europe that it, it goes from bad to worse. So there's no point having a class or neurotic retired service people lecturing against the evils of Marxism. Marxism has had it. You understand? Yet we need to address whatever problems in the world. Now, then the last 
We'll, we'll take a minute on that, because I don't mean that there aren't any Marxists in the world. But when whole kingdoms come down, uh, I don't need to have an apologetic argument against Marxism in Russia. They've already got one. There's no lot of sociological analysis going on. Oh, that's, that's for graduate students. So, you know, have nothing more to do than write Westlaw's papers for Germany. You see, if it were still hot and then growing, we'd have to address it. Now, it's impossible to address everything, but what do we do? We, I, I suggest we address the things that are on the line and hot. Is, is that unreasonable? Is that I'm not trying to defend? Now, this last thing would be New Age. And Geisler's book is useful, Christian Apologetics and New Age. Now, New Age, though, opens us up to Hinduism and Buddhism and Eastern mysticism. The West has never been more open to that. 100 million Americans participate in New Age. Well, that's a problem, isn't it? See, so I'm not trying to palm off on you problem, things that I think are problematic. You study a culture and find out where the cutting edges are. Is that unreasonable as an educational procedure? And it has nothing else to do whether you're interested in apologetics. I want to ask this question as I start to give you some data. What does the Bible have to say, well, I'm shortening that, say about the apologetic enterprise? Do we have any examples of it in the Bible? That's all just simple, uh, just slightly above devotional remarks about the Bible, about the apologetic text. Now let's turn, show you two or three things in the syllabus, and that's the last time that we'll take any time uh, on that again. Look at the aims, and look at the passages, Psalm 19 and Acts 17. This is over the aim of the school, uh, the mission of God, the mission of the school, and the mission, what does this class have to do? What's God's mission in the world? What's the Bible say is the mission of the church? And what does this class have to do with it? Every class has to ask those questions. I don't mean because the president to ask it. I've always asked for 22 years, so it's great. What does this class have to do with this world? Whose world is this? And only a worldview can address it. So here, just as a model, not as a proof case, but we've got creation, we need to study creation, and we need to study revelation in the literary structure of Psalm 19, just as an example. That's all, all that I said before. Now we've got other examples, but that's not just a devotional remark. Uh, we find the first six verses, creation has to be, because creation glorifies God. Well, we need to study creation. But creation can't save us. Here is be the world's greatest astronomer and go to hell. So we need revelation to tell us about the law, the Torah in Psalm 19. Well, that's revelation. It shouldn't be translated very often as law. That sounds legal. But instruction, information. So the relationship, Christian education, Christian worldview, what's the relationship of creation and revelation? Now, we learn some things about God, and I'm not talking about natural theology. I mean, any classical sense of, well, let's just study the heavens and the earth, and we'll get some natural theology and convert the world. I didn't say that. But the Bible says that creation glorifies God. It's intricate symmetry. Well, I believe that. But that's not a substitute for this. And then we hear ad nauseum about integration. How do a Christian view of education, this class, this seminary, this school, do integration? Now, integration is possible only within the individual, within the student. There is no possibility of a class in integration. Because integration at the individual level means awareness and, and acceptance. The integration takes place through the faith, trying to order the world, and God, and the gospel, so we don't get caught up. See, I'm just interested in evangelism. I'm not interested in social relevance. I use the word social relevance. 
two or three things here. In the book of Genesis, there are four things that sin does. It breaks up God and man's relationship. It breaks up man, himself, all the psychological perimeter. Man and his social structure. I'm going to put social institutions here. Marriage, family, and uh, ecology. Or, or, yeah, I'll just put that. That just comes from Greek. Like the systems of nature. Now, sin disrupts God and man. Man and himself. So all the uh, psychology and, and the research areas here does not show up, but people are broken somehow. So, so it's not like a sermon. It's not about anything. See? Man and social structures. Think of the institutions. See, no culture lasts when the institutions that stabilize it are in trouble. See, if the community is in trouble and the families are in trouble in the community, that trouble will come to church. You know, they won't keep the trouble at home and say, well, we're keeping our trouble at home and we're going to be a powerful, loving uh, exemplification in the church. It never happens. Every trouble in every church is over a troubled family or a troubled father, a troubled mother, a troubled children in the environment of uh, socialization. What does that have to do with apology? Everything's about apology. So these three areas, earth, I'm just going to put nature, that this material says it belongs to God. So I want to ask you to think about a Christian worldview. You hear that ad nauseum. We've never managed in the 15 years of IBS to get very many people to see what a worldview is except on a test. Uh, that's unfortunate. At one time I was optimistic about that. I'm not optimistic about it. I'm optimistic about a Christian worldview, but about not its general penetration. People ask, well, is it going to be on exam? And, you know, when you hear that, you're already downhill. It'd be like on Mont Blanc, see, in the Alps. And you start downhill, and you say, whoops, I don't want to go down here. It's too late. See, you have to finish out the ride. <laughs> now, let's look quickly, quickly at page two of the, of the, uh, uh, so, page two of the, the larger, about the class, so I can get caught up, see, in these matters and start that in six or seven minutes here. Now, we're going to have a report on questions, questions, uh, next time. Scott Lake, you're, you're all set. Then I will start, even today, I'm going to start from biblical to patristic apologetics to show you that there is such a concern and show you changing conditions and changing concerns, even in the Bible. The Bible is aware of changing context, changing issues to deal with, so we have biblical models for being aware of the things that we're going to address. Uh, then we're going to look at Augustine. Well, Augustine is the first person to say, hey, Christianity cannot use pagan thought forms to articulate the Christian viewpoint. Up to that point, Aristotle and Plato had been used. Now, the practical problem is Augustine was a Neoplatonist. His epistemology is Neoplatonism. So, it might not be possible to do his project, but we're going to look at it anyway. See? That's where Reformation and Calvinistic, all the epidemic of apologetics literature, come from the Calvinists. Well, that's because of a worldview. It's not because they don't have anything to do but write apologetics books. See, it's not an accident that Geister, all these people, Schaefer, Carl Henry, Montgomery, every person that's written, see, anything since Paley, are Calvinists. In fact, Paley was the Church of England Calvinist. So Pascal, Pascal is in the context of the astronomical revolution. So he's going to have an argument that addresses the, the thing of making man very small because the universe is very large and the earth is very small. So his argument, see, is going to address something that man lost his significance in the universe. And that was in Pascal's world. Can you imagine where most people are about that now? And then Kierkegaard. Kierkegaard was addressing Hegel. Now, this is not a class in Kierkegaard. We have historically had classes in Kierkegaard, in Hegel. Uh, absolutely indispensable for understanding Marxism and liberation theology. Other than that, you don't need it at all. Uh, but Kierkegaard, when he speaks of the system, is speaking about Hegel. 
and we go from Hegel to Darwin for a complete evolutionary perspective. He opens us up there. So Kierkegaard is trying to save the faith from Hegel. Well, that's a good project, but he can't do it. Because when we're done with Kierkegaard, God is wholly other. The Bible never says that, just the opposite. And he has a view of faith that can't be touched by science and historical criticism in all the things that uh, you may or may not be worried about. Now, if we could show that the Bible has 10,000 errors in the Pentateuch and 12,000 errors in the Synoptics, that would go badly, prime especially, against the claim that it's inspired. Because you don't need to be inspired to be mistaken. Because most people can be mistaken just on kind of native talent. Well, it's not just these weird names, and I'm not asking you to get a series of studies on Augustine or Pascal or Kierkegaard. I'm, I'm asking you to think about them as, when we get to them, contextualize them and say, now, what's the problem? How are they addressing the problem? And can we still use that? Hmm? Because everything that's old isn't false. Euclidean geometry is uh, uh, 2,500 years old, and except for the fifth postulate, is still you build houses and railroads and buildings, see, on Euclidean geometry. But uh, space is, as a matter of fact, not Euclidean geometry. It is not describable by Euclidean geometry. So does that mean people don't believe geometry anymore? No, that just means that they've expanded non-Euclidean geometry to identify what's there. Hmm? It's quite simple. Now, Schaefer, now in the 60s and 70s, 1947, Schaefer left uh, St. Louis and went to Labri, French word for the shelter. And in by the 70s, you know, his word was famous and InterVarsity published four or five little uh, simpler statements. Now, Schaefer's contribution was that the generation of the, the boomers, the 60s, and the hippies and the anti-intellectuals and the Jesus freaks who did their thinking with the seat of their pants, that were opposed to soap and salvation. And uh, see, they've become uh, normative, and now their babies are boomerangers, what are the boomers and the boomerangers. See, you get a culture like that, and it's not like nothing happens. It's like what happens, and it's happening. Hmm? Well, what's happening? We'll look a little on that. Now, when we come to, and I'm not just tacking it in there, but it is another matter. See, apologetics is a broad framework, and Christian evidences, after the historical revolution, it was adjudged that no amount of historical evidence could prove an absolutely certain final and undeveloping faith. Now, the Christian faith affirms that it's once and for all. Isn't you know what it says, just biblically, is that what it claims? Well, you have a whole historical, 19th century's fundamental uh, judgment was that all human consciousness is relative, is, is historical consciousness. And to claim that this part of human consciousness in the New Testament is absolutely final for Alexander Campbell and the rest of the world is absurd within that viewpoint. See, it's like reality is in process and some group just stops that and says, that's the end of anything that's going to happen here. And it loses touch with what's going on. So how do we know the New Testament is final authority? Well, you better have a worldview that makes sense out of that kind of claim. Or no thinking person, and sometimes even thinking person said, hey, that's absurd. That's why we have to ground what we're talking in something larger than just how rapid and how loud we can talk. Historical, now I have just one time. Now that's a resurrection time. That's at resurrection time. And I don't mean the resurrection isn't worth any more than a week. But real resurrection talk is not can we harmonize the resurrection pericopes in the synoptics and in the theology of resurrection and the rest of the Bible. I believe that, but uh, that is much larger than that. The best single chapter is still Craig's book, I put that on reserve, but it's a little heavy. You can't pop that right directly to fifth and sixth graders, see? Because if you don't sing and look weird and sound weird, you can't get a crowd, see, high schooler. So you, you have to have nothing to say and say it sonorously to have a crowd. Uh, 
You'll have 3,000 when nothing's present, and you have 40 when they're trying to do something with the kids. Hmm? Does that make sense? And in 20 of the 40, I'm not sure if they didn't overextend their concern here. Now, we'll have one session on resurrection. But read, and I gave you a paper, did I not, on theories of evidence. Did I not give you such a paper? And we can only take one time on it. And I'm saying now, evangelistically, that you and I believe it's more important than, than uh, two hours or so. I'm affirming that, but we don't have time in this class. D get that, because I, I want to. See, what's evidence in math? Evidence is not a univocal term. What is evidence in mathematics? It is not the same thing as evidence in law. What is evidence in math and law is not the same thing as evidence in physics, or biology, or economics. Is that, is that just on the surface, does that make sense? We're going to address that? Because when you say we've got evidence for, that's the technical weakness of uh, uh, McDowell's books. It's not that they're evil, it's that they're much more limited than most people are aware even though they're useful for certain uh, groups of people in the world. But evidence is not univocal. And evidence is interpreted by worldview presuppositions. See, what is evidence in one worldview is not evidence, you see, in another worldview. See, miracle to an animus, he's already got a worldview to assimilate that and take the sting out and say, well, miracle proves that Jesus is the Son of God. He said, well, we do them all the time. What's that proof? Well, then we have to investigate whether that's actually the case. Or whether the rabbis in the time of Jesus, see, we have rabbinic texts that say the rabbis perform miracles. And, uh, see, we get miracle talk out in the greco Roman world in the New Testament. We don't get miracle talk or debates about it in the Jewish world because all the rabbis believed in it. So we see that in the Bible. So that's what this is. Now the best chapter is Craig's chapter in Apologetics on resurrection. But it is, it's not easy, and it has to be assimilated and thinned down and preached, I think. But the best book in any language that I know of, I know of hundreds, is Craig's work, which is part of a doctoral thesis, Craig's work on, a, on resurrection. Uh, and it's only $79.95, that's why we don't have it. It's $80. So I want you to be aware of the book, uh, even though it's rather precarious whether we'll even have it in our library. It's $80 to see for a book. But you have to ask whether res intelligent defense of the resurrection is worth $80. You see what they come from? Because that'd buy three or four lesser books. <coughs> Okay. So if you're counting books, that's one thing. If you're weighing them, that's another. Christian? I'm just curious, how, how useful or perhaps obsolete would Boris book be? Uh, then you go, well, that's biblical. You see, and he, he tries to show that the biblical account of resurrection has integrity. That's an issue, but see, that's a chapter in the whole issue. Right. So it's not evil, it's just overly limited. Mm -hmm. So the useful stuff in Geisler's undergraduate book is useful, but it's not enough. Well, it's enough for most undergraduates, see, but it's not enough for the issue. So we have to find out for whom is it enough. See, nothing is enough for most people, you and I know. What's the name of the book? It's the Historical Foundation of the Resurrection, and it's from Carnegie Mellon. You already know it's a technical press, but seventy nine ninety five. I said goodbye to that. Well, I'll give you some tools on the resurrection, but simpler books may not address all the things that bother people. But after the historiographical revolution, and after the scientific revolution, historical claims, like in Lacing's Ugly Ditch, Peter Berger's Fiery Breed, that nothing historical can prove any truth once and for all. Well, see, that's a theory of history, and that's a theory of evidence, and that's what's really important. But uh, we can only do so much in this. Now, Resurrection Week of Witnessing will be out. Apologetics and Pluralism and Humanism. How does, human, how does man come to be the center of the universe? He comes to be the center of the universe with the scientific revolution doing two things. Scientific revolution created mathematics, 
that supposedly was autonomous, and they produced a method that was autonomous. And from the 17th and 18th century development in the West, if math is autonomous, and method is the only method of attaining truth, scientific method, then a finite human being, finite man, produced two proofs for his capacity to not need God for reference, see, for argument. And since method collapsed and Virgil's standard collapses this, we have to wait until the 20th century before these two assumptions are collapsed. And many people aren't even aware that they're collapsed now. And most of the church is not aware that those issues have collapsed. And many people uh, are still operating in the 19th century. I've been trying to hurdle our brotherhood into the 20th century for quarter of a century, it failed, and we're about to go into the 21st century. So if, if I were in despair, do you see how much despair would be heaped on me? Now, on page three, quickly, of the syllabus, <coughs> there are three basic tasks of theology, studying the Bible. One is the Bible. What does the word say? Every Christian should major in that. You should have no majors in Old New Testament, but we do. Every person should know the Bible, have the tools of dealing with the Bible. Now I have that strange word there, heuristics. Now Scott is a, a Harvard graduate specialist in Greek, but the Greek word, which you get heuristics, now, I'm not asking you to go up into the churches and say, I have two sermons on heuristics. They say, what? And they'd have an emergency elders meeting, said, He's talking pornographic again. 